Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on this edition of the Primetime Newscast on Equinox Television, live from our headquarters in Cameroon's economic capital Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. In our top stories in this edition of the news, about 50 persons have been deprived of their source of livelihood in Kuseri, in the far north region of the Republic of Cameroon. Their stores were consumed by wild flames at the Kuseri market to bring to you details in this edition of the newscast on equinox television and out of the country niger records its deadliest attacks by jihadis the death toll of sunday's attacks on three villages has risen to 137. Wild flames have consumed several stores in the Kuseri market in the far north region of the Republic of Cameroon, and that fire incident has deprived close to 50 persons of their source of livelihoods. Manjik and Gabriel, fire syndicates. It was a difficult end of day for business operators at the Kuseri market in the far north region of Cameroon. An uninvited inferno took the market by surprise after business operators had closed for the day. Sources say the fire that began at 7 p.m. Monday was provoked by the forceful return of electricity in the town of Marwa. A battle put up by the army rescue unit, aided by another from Jamina Chad, at the time the inferno started, ended in the early hours of Tuesday. The market, which is noted, for the sale of a variety of items was this morning completely grounded. <laughs> Dresses could however be seen, though nothing could be done with them again. Other business operators and inhabitants were spotted either picking irons or folding zings that were not touched by the fire. A total of about 80 stores have this far been confirmed destroyed by the inferno. It is the second time fire is visiting the Kuseri market. The last time was on March 22. 2017. In a similar story, several persons in the town of Douala, the economic capital of the Republic of Cameroon, have equally seen their uh, sources of livelihood destroyed this time around, not by fire, but by agents of the Douala City Council. And they were destroyed during an operation aimed at fighting urban disorder in the town of Douala and several uh, makeshift stores established along the road, notably around the Sandaka market area, were destroyed today by municipal agents. Several vehicles were also impounded during that operation in as a report. Douala must mature from the mayor's slogan, clean city to a practical reality, according to agents of the Douala City Council, who in an operation to also enhance order around the Sandanga market, demolished several business kiosks along the road, which caused congestion. <laughs> Several motorbikes, police stations along the roads were also impounded. Il y a toujours un produit de sensibilisation. 
qui vise à leur faire comprendre l'importance de respecter la réglementation urbaine. Traders who were selling along the road say they were not only taken unaware, but brutalized and their costly goods scattered all over. Mais ce matin, on a été brusqué, même pas une avertation, même pas une alerte. They should have at least alerted us of such an operation. We admit our wrong towards the regulations in place, reason why we have no option than go home with the losses. Bon, tant plus que nous, nous, au-dessus de la loi, on a assumé les pertes et le peu qu'on a pu récupérer, on a récupéré, mais nous sommes, nous sommes pas satisfaits. Other traders hail the action, saying, if long-lasting, it will put total end to traffic jam and disorder, always registered here. L'action que le grand maire a entrepris, c'est une très belle action parce que ça libère. The question we, however, ask ourselves is, will the action last long? That is the question, parce que là, monsieur... The city council must put in place a monitoring team. Pour que cette équipe reste pour faire partie les commerçants véreux qui vont revenir. City Council agents present during the exercise, plus a team has already been put in place to monitor any attempt by stubborn traders to reinstall their kiosk along the road. Nous allons laisser une équipe de veille pour que notre action ne soit pas une action précaire, une action... The city council agents debunk statements by some traders. No warning was served. The commerçants and the public who are around these spaces are aware that this action will arrive. Though no clear program has been established, we are told. The operation ongoing in the Douala 1 subdivision for now will in the days ahead move to Aqua, Bonanjo, Bonaprizo and certainly all over the city of Douala. He died in the hands of his kidnappers in the crisis-stricken southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. He is His Royal Majesty Ikomengale Emmanuel, traditional ruler of Dibanda Mile 4 in Boya subdivision. And since his death, the traditional stool has been vacant. And now his 24-year-old son, Ndivson, Ndivson Ndive Ikome, takes over from his family. Father, the level 400 student of the University of Boya is now the traditional ruler of the Banda Mile 4 village. He takes over from his father killed or who died in the hands of his abductors. Details in this report by Derry Jato and Boya. The royal family and the royal kinsmen. After his father, Chief Ekomengale Emmanuel, traditional ruler of Mile 14 Dibanda, died in the hands of his abductors suspected separatist fighter some months back. His son, Ndafesin Dive Ekome, is succeeding him as the traditional ruler of the Dibanda people. A consultative talk supervised by Abba Abdurrahman, the divisional officer for Buya subdivision, witnessed the royal family and the kingmakers throwing their weight behind Ndafesin Dive Ekome as their chief elect. Tundekok Armstrong, chairman of the traditional council of Dibanda village, the contribution of everyone is needed to support their new leader. I will advise the people of Dibanda for us to tear down the war of hatred, the war of blackmail. So I'm advising everybody to rally behind the new chief so that we can achieve great things. The crowd at the occasion was judged by the new traditional ruler as a reflection of trust and hope of the Dibanda people on him. First of all, I will tell the people of Dibanda that the confidence which they gave me to become their new traditional ruler, the custodian of the customs and tradition of my 14 Dibanda, I won't let them down. I started Chief Elendafesin Dive Ekome is a level 400 student of the University of Boya. He is within public administration.
Ndame Island Village in Limbe, Fako Division, Southwest Region of the Republic of Cameroon to be relocated. This is the uh, priority of the new and pioneer chief of that island village in the southwest region of the uh, country. His Majesty Oswald Njombo Ekomboni says that uh, the island village can no longer contain its inhabitants and there has been a steady increase in the inhabitants of that particular village. Details with our correspondents in Limbe, Davidson Maimo. Ndame Island Village, located some few nautical miles in the sea along the coast of Limbe 2 subdivision, had never had a recognized traditional leader. The coronation and installation of the pioneer traditional leader was an opportunity for the sons and daughters of Ndame to live the experience of their great grandparents. From the sea to the once inhabited core of the island is a tedious tax. <laughs> This is my first time to come here. Terrible. Since they gave birth to me, it's my first time climbing this kind of way. During that time, God was really taking care of them because the road is not easy. Just to enter the flying boat to reach here is a nightmare. Not to talk of. After getting at the side of the water to climb where they were living, they tried. My first time of entering a flying boat, and not to talk of coming here. This explains why the ancestral land was abandoned as Ndame people integrated to nearby villages such as Bota Land, Wovia, and Fo, present day Limbe. Just to go and buy food at Dam Beach and coming back against the tides. It's a very uh, tremendous job they were doing. The reason that I spoke about it is because it is not good. The traditional rituals performed by the chiefs of Bota Land and Wovia testify of the relationship the three villages have as they are from the Wovia clan and not from the Bakure clan. Officially installing the chief, the divisional officer of Limbe II, Serge Mikel Abel, says the ceremony at the ancestral land of the Ndame people offered him an opportunity to serve the rich cultural, touristic and natural site the Republic of Cameroon is blessed with. We used to say Cameroon is Africa in miniature. With this type of uh, area of sites, we can confirm it, to come and discover and put our foot in this, our ancestral land. This Dame Island landscape is a touristic site. Chief Oswald Njombo says, with the island envisaged by the state for a touristic heaven, and a site small to accommodate the growing population of Ndame people. Relocating the village is all they can ask from the state. Oh no, the, this is not, we are not asking for a extension. We are asking for relocation. And relocation is, is faster than extension. We need the government to come and see how they, they can develop Ndame. The coronation is allegedly contested by some on grounds the Ndame people were not freely allowed to designate their chief. I want this chieftaincy issue of Ndame Island become a source of reconciliation. The ceremony was crowned with a canoe race depicting the true culture of the Wovia clan. David Sunmaimo reporting there from Limbe in the southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. On to something else now. Health and administrative officials in Bankem in the Kupe Manikuba Division, southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon, are stepping up sensitization against the coronavirus pandemic with the new wave. The area has recorded as of now six cases and no death. And of course, the health officials. Are putting everything in place and of course uh, at the level of checkpoints there are measures that have been put in place to ensure that nobody gets into banking without having gone through uh, a kind of a check against the coronavirus pandemic details in this report since the beginning of the covid 19 pandemic the town of Bangem in the kupe maningoba division of the southwest region has already recorded six cases fortunately all cured According to information gotten from the head of the health district in Bangem, the second wave of COVID-19 has urged administrative authorities 
trend back on its sensitization campaign so as to maintain a 0% rate of infection within the community. We are always starting with uh, sensitization on the field. We are giving instruction to our forces of law and order in all the checkpoints to verify it and uh, to tell their population that the poor of the max is an obligation. From the beginning of COVID-19 from last year, Bangem has recorded six cases and all six cases have recovered. We've had no deaths. So relatively, um, we have a case fatality rate of zero. So I think Bangem is doing well. Also, um, with respect to screening, screening is free. It's in all our facilities, the health centers and at the district hospital. Also, um, there's also a protocol. If it's negative, that's fine. If it's positive, the protocol and the treatment is free. So uh, people should just keep on their preventive measures. We are on the second wave of COVID and people should take all their precautions. Although the barrier measures are respected at the 75% rate, some people are still dormant respecting these measures. Well, some people don't want to put on the mask because they believe that Corona does not exist. And uh, they say if you put on masks or you don't put on masks, you still die. Whether the corona is there or the corona is not there, you still die. The authority has decided to make a sensitization to, for, for us to put on the map. And it's good because it's rather preferable for you to preserve yourself than to die with the illness. However, the divisional officer of the area, Felix Nanga, says they will stop at nothing to keep the town of Bangem safe from the COVID-19 pandemic. Inhabitants of BMRC, a neighborhood in Cameroon's political capital Yaoundé, raised concerns over inadequate electric energy supply in the area. They have gone for several days without electric energy, and they are saying that economic activities in particular are on a near standstill as, as a result of the negative impact of poor electric energy supply in the area. Details in this report compiled by Immaculate Fogui. The entire BMRC neighborhood in the city of Yaoundé in the dark. Civil business persons operating around government school BMRC are experiencing enormous financial losses due to epileptic energy supply. <laughs> Things are not moving. For days we have been without electricity. We need power to operate. What I do needs constant electricity due to epileptic energy supply. A lot of our appliances are now beyond repair. Even our children cannot study. We now depend on candles. A situation which preoccupies defenders of consumer rights who plan carrying out a peaceful walk in order to express their discontent. We cannot spend two days without lights going off and appliances blowing up. It's terrible. A lot of people have lost their appliances due to the situation. Consumers should not be treated this way. According to an official of the company in charge of distributing electricity, rehabilitation works began on the 9th of March. Laurent Patrice Emissé adds that at the end of the project, the population will enjoy better services. 250 technicians are on the field carrying out work. At the end of the project, the population will enjoy the best services. Localities like Tinga Village, Kolbong, Etudi Abatwa, Emana, and its environs will equally not be left out. While waiting for the return of electricity, inhabitants now rely on candles, bush lamps, solar bulbs, and generators for electrification. Now in news, out of the Republic of Cameroon, the death toll from coordinated raids on three villages in Niger by suspected jihadists last Sunday has risen to 137. The government said by uh, systematically targeting civilians, these non-state armed groups are reaching a level, a new level of horror and savagery. Earlier, a security source blamed militants of the Islamic State group IS for the attacks in 
Tahua region near Niger's border with Mali. It is the deadliest massacre in Niger by suspected militants. The West African nation is facing an upsurge in suspected jihadist violence with an estimated 300 people dying this year in attacks last week. At least 58 people returning from market were killed in Tilaberi region in Tilaberi region in the southwest near the Mali border. Gunmen targeted the bears or the boss of the victims. Militants linked to IS and Al Qaeda are active in the Sahel region, a semi arid stretch of land just south of the Sahara Desert, which includes Mali, Chad, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mauritania. The Boko Haram group is also active in Niger's on Niger's border with Nigeria in the south eastern part. And that's it for this first segment of the news. Talking point is up next. Thank you for joining us in Talking Point. Today we are receiving Barrister Anineba Innocent Akufo is an attorney and counselor at law in New York, human rights defender and major proponent of decolonization. Barrister, thank you for joining us today. Always a pleasure, Mr. Babila. All right, we're going to be discussing uh, a statement recently issued by Human Rights Watch senior researcher in Central Africa, Ilaria Aligrossi, and she says that the three African members of the United Nations Security Council, Kenya, Niger, Tunisia, should use their power to ensure scrutiny of human rights crisis in Africa. For example, she cites the case of Cameroon, and she says that without this scrutiny, victims uh, victims hope for justice and accountability may be dashed. What's your take on the statement? Well, it was a pretty loaded statement, Mr. Babila. And again, um, thanks for your viewers on Equinox. I always love coming on your show and uh, the entire uh, uh, Equinox clan. Um, it was a pretty loaded statement, as I said, uh, from the, um, the, the journalist um, from uh, uh, Human Rights. But this is the issue, Mr. Babila. Uh, when I look at, when I, when I listen to statements like this, I go back to the Bible and I look at the, um, the story of uh, uh, Jacob and Laban, you know, how Jacob tended Laban's sheep in order to win the hand of Rachel in marriage. And after a couple of years of tending the sheep, you know, he slept with an illusion because the night he was supposed to get the bride or to get the woman, you know, he was given a layer which was not the taste. That was not the person that he vied for or he worked all his life for. So when I look at all this stuff, you know, that the journalist is writing about Africa and the A3's admission into the United Nations Security Council, I always go back to the premise. You know, I go back to the premise because there are five, there, there is something called the P5, which is the United States, the United Kingdom, France, you know, the former Soviet Union, uh, it was the uh, the Soviet Union then, but now it's Russia and of course China. And you have to understand that any of these people, whatever you aspire for, whatever you decide to do, any of this, either of these people might, just, they have a veto power. And once they say it is not going to happen, it's not going to happen. So some of this stuff, admitting Niger and Tunisia and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and Kenya into the, into the A3, for me, it's a good start. You know, that's a down payment for the Africans because if you look at Europe, Europe is not, it's, a, it's, it's just a little portion of Africa, but they have two permanent members, you know, and we with the population and the size of Africa, we have none for more than 50 years. It is only now that they're realizing that Africa has to have a seat at the table. Now they bring these three people, but they don't have the veto power that the P5 has. So I really, because if you look at that particular statement you're talking about, you know, China and Russia, they've already told you that the, the, the issue in Tigray, it's an internal issue. It's not something that has to rise to the level of international diplomacy, something that you have to bring before the Security Council. And that's exactly the same thing they will tell you, that the issue in the Southern Cameroons and the Republic of Cameroon, it is something that's internal. But until you wave this thing up, you bring it up to the level of international conflict, 
then they will still give you the same thing because if one member of the security council says it is this is what it is and that's what is going to going to happen so yes we applaud what the human rights watch uh, journalists is saying but still we might not have the real solution in the end because somebody has a veto power over the a3 and that's where we find ourselves you know when the african union was created in 2001 we thought they would do something this will be a new beginning but if you look at it what are the statistics nothing has happened in africa which is liaising between which is a liaison between the african union and and the west and of course when i talk about the west i'm talking about the five permanent members of the security council all they do is they bother for their interest if it is not their interest they would not do it and if you go against their interest they would veto it so in the end this is just what i told you it's jacob and laban you tend the ship in the end they give you something that you did not want to and uh, when the uh, senior researcher for Human Rights Watch in Central Africa, Ilaria Likrosi, says that uh, Kenya and, of course, Niger and Tunisia, these three African nations, should use their powers in the United Nations Security Council to uh, do something or to press for uh, efforts to be made to prevent or put an end to the continuous violations and abuse of human rights in African nations like Cameroon. It means there is something that these three nations can do. And the question is, what can they do or what should they do? Well, the thing is, again, it just comes to tell you exactly what I told you before. Um, the fact that we have a seat at the Security Council now, based on these three um, nations, these three African nations, it, it's a good start. That's what I said. It's a good start. This is like a down payment for your home that you want to buy. You know, it gives you access to the resources for you to be able to get to the Security Council. But again, if this thing goes contrary to the interest, what, whatever Kenya says, whatever Tunisia says, or whatever Niger says, let's say Niger says something that's against this, the, the CFA zone right there. Guess who is going to, you know, veto it? It will be the Frenchman. So um, at some point, we, we, we do applaud all this. But again, in the end, I don't just want to be that prophet of doom, thinking that everything that, you know, issues from these multilateral organizations is something that's doomed to fail. No, I have faith, and I have faith. The issue of Africans having solutions for Africans, that's where it's going to, that's where it's supposed to happen first, because if we cannot find the solutions to our own internal and you know regional problems you're bringing the west into it look the pinch has been felt by us the laws that we write in our constitutions and the laws that we write to coordinate our multilateral organizations these are all things that are written by you people the parliamentarians and all the ministers i mean whoever are the lawmakers in these individual countries the west did not come to write it for you so if you write it to favor the west guess what in the end they have a say in what you're doing than what you yourselves been mandated by your people to do so if the the journalist is saying that you know kenya is there they are there but in the end you ask yourself you know it is let me you see like in the uh, the former yugoslavia and bosnia this was a, a loose confederate uh, 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 you know conglomerate of states that were you know bundled together and after the, uh, the Cold War, they realized that they could not exist, they could not coexist. And that's what brought the, um, the, the, the Bosnian War. And in Sons of Empire, Mr. Jeffrey is telling you people that, you know, when these things are being forced based on political and ideologies of a foreign power, in the end, it will still fail because the masses will arise and they will, you know, they will agitate against all this. So no matter what Kenya does, no matter what all these three would do, you know, Auden, Auden looked at it when the, when the Communist Manifesto came out, when Marx and Engel wrote it, you know, it was sweet and dandy. Everybody thought this is the best thing that they've had, you know, besides democracy. You know, they visited the, the, the Soviet Union until when Auden lived there and realized that this is not what it's supposed to be. He said, let's clear from your heads this mass of impressive rubbish, rally and the, 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 the stumbling spirits of the will till we construct, alas, a human justice. So whatever they say that Kenya will do for Africa, again, you, I, best, I bet you, Kenya is already loaded with its own problems and they might not find a solution, especially for something that's in Cameroon, that we Cameroonians or you Cameroonians can sit down at the table and say, you know what, 
let's not listen to the West. Let's listen to our brothers on the other side of the, 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 the Mongo. And this was a, conf uh, a configuration that made you people look lesser to the other people. Let's sit as same people. Don't look at the West. Please sit there and discuss these issues and you'll find a solution that the West will be an envy of. Ilaria Allegrosi highlights an issue of justice and accountability. And there are many victims of atrocities uh, committed in the northwest and southwest regions of the country, as it is the case in many African countries where there are political and security crises, uh, still expecting, still hoping for justice after many years. We have the case of Ngarbu, the Ngarbu massacre. Uh, the, the victims are still waiting for justice. And when we go far back in 2008 with the hunger strike, recently some civil society organizations were speaking here in Douala, and they said that there are many victims of that hunger strike who are still waiting for justice after many years. Now, what do you, when you look at all this as a, um, an, an attorney and counselor at law and human rights defender, what's your analysis of this issue of accountability and justice being denied victims, according to uh, what Ilaria Legrossi is saying and other civil society organizations. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Babila. Um, sometimes the, the, the quest for justice is just as elusive as the quest for the, uh, the Holy Grail. You know, you may not find it. And again, as I always tell you, you might twist the scales of justice and they will ultimately balance, but it will balance at whose favor. That's what it, this is all about. So the Cameroon government might tell you that they found justice in Garbu, but at whose expense or at whose default, you know, beneficial, you know, um, judgment did that go to? So again, the quest for justice, it is absolutely, it is something that's elusive. If you look at the human rights abuses back in the Cameroons, growing up, this is not the type of society where we, we, we found ourselves. And if it got to a point where they've deployed a civil war on the other side of the country this is where the again as i said this is anomie this is anomie where society degenerates the government can no longer control its people and the only way that the government can seek justice is to use force and guess what force never actually succeeds because you can cover it at a certain point but in the end it will dissolve and it will evaporate and it will blow you the government away i'm not soliciting that this should happen in the cameroons but sit with your brother and sister look at the laws that you've written because the the, the laws in cameroon look at the penal code the constitution itself it's written to protect the interests of the west i beg your pardon you, you understand you know i'm i'm reading the copy of your the, the ohada the economic agreement for western african you know for the the, the cfa zone in cameroon guess what if you look at it, there is, I think there is some, um, there is a particular section, I think section five or six, I'll look at that. Don't hold me to that. But what that section tells you is, it gives absolute total immunity, you know, to that organization called OHADA. It gives absolute immunity to the officers, the top officers of OHADA, which means those are the presidents who signed that particular document. And those are the, the, the foreign entities that are part of that organization. So if you're doing something economic in your little uh, vicinity in Douala or in Bamenda or in Santa, my village, guess what? The, somebody in France is controlling that. Somebody in Senegal is controlling that. So if you get that type, those type of laws that are being written by foreigners imposed on you guys, then absolutely there will be no justice. So the journalist for human rights, she may or he may actually deplore all the atrocities that are happening but you have to understand that it is just human nature if it gets to a point where you have to react you have to react because if you attack me one two three times guess what the third time i'll have to respond it might not be proportional but i will have the right it's a natural right for me to respond if you attack me so it is not something that you have to go back for that from somebody and if you're doing that, it's because of the injustice that society has meted on you people. So, again, as I said, I respect, I fully respect what the journalist is saying. But in terms of the laws that exist in our land, you cannot really find freedom in it. Because the, I don't blame the West for that. I blame those who write those laws because you don't write something to favor the West. Mm. There have been calls for targeted sanctions on some African uh, leaders, some uh, 
leaders in the countries where there are crises, for example, in the Cameroon. Is it uh, possible for Niger, Kenya, and uh, the, 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 the three African countries that are in the United Nations Security Council to press for this kind of uh, measures to be taken by the superpowers in order to mount more pressure on the authorities in those countries, including Cameroon, to solve the crisis, to provide solutions to the crisis, to put an end to the human rights violations going on? Well, that is true. You know, um, at a certain point where this soft diplomacy works, yes, we can go through these countries because, again, as I said, if you have a seat, you better be in the tent than being out of the tent. As one politician, one politician here in the United States said, I might say it a little bit crudely, um, you better pee in the tent than you stand and pee outside because, you know, everybody will feel the stench while you are in there in that particular tent. So it is good that we have these three African countries, but it is a decision too late. More than how many years when this United Nations was uh, was formed, now we have three non-veto powers in the United Nations. Yes, it is good that they are there. They made table certain things. But about the issue of targeted sanctions about, uh, you know, on these corrupt officials, not just in Cameroon, but in other African countries. I mean, those sanctions never actually work because, you know, they always find a way around it. If you tell them, you know, they would always find a way around it. And they, the only thing is they may not travel. They may not travel. But again, guess what? They hold all the papers. They can travel under different identities. And they've done that in the past. So some of this stuff that the journalist is saying, it is something that we can bring it in front of the uh, the uh, the, uh, the Security Council. So our P3 or our A3, that is good. Bring it before the P5. If you keep insisting, at some point they would listen to you. Because the killings and the atrocities back in the Cameroons is just so much. They've laid waste our fellow classes. And these are things that we cannot just sit beside and just look. You know, you have to somehow, you know, um, speak up against it and i'm praying that cameroonians of sane thinking should get up and tell their government that this is what's going wrong you know we cannot just maintain the status quo and think that we're looking for tomorrow because to uh, uh today's today is not what we want for tomorrow the configuration is totally wrong because if you look at the parliament that i just saw the other day i mean age is not an issue because our current president in the united states is almost 80 you know, but there is a little bit of sanity in what he does. But if you bring people who are just, you know, they out of work, you know, what law has, what, what laws can they even, if somebody cannot even read something that has been prepared in front of him, then how can that body articulate the laws that's been written in the country? And how can that person even think about the future? You understand? So at some point, we ourselves have to tell some of this of our, our representatives that please just step down and let somebody else, you know, take over and move the country to a better perspective. Now, talking about Africans solving the problems of the continent, what's your opinion about the manner in which the African Union, and even uh, coming back to Cameroon now, the uh, Central African Regional Bloc have been reacting to the security crisis in Cameroon and other countries? Yeah, Mr. Babila, it's absolutely deplorable. It is um, unconscionable. It is something that I cannot even think about it. Um, we cannot always wait for foreign parliaments, you know, to sanction, you know, things that are part of our society. No, you cannot always wait for the foreign parliaments. We have to do it. Or our regional organizations. This is a conflict that has happened for, for four years. A neighboring country like Nigeria, a neighboring country like the Central African Republic, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, what do they do? They facilitate. They facilitate what can... Just one second, please. They facilitate, they facilitate um, what the government of Cameroon can do. Because if you look at what happened in the Equatorial Guinea a couple of days ago, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you don't have to tell me why something would happen like that in a foreign capital. And the first people to be there are Cameroonian officials. I don't know why they went there, but again, I don't think it was just going to sympathize with this foreign country. They could have done that by doing a phone call or, you know, something via the Internet. And you do that and you, go, you get out of it. So these countries, this configuration of countries in Africa, they are ruled by people with a common clique. 
and what all they want to do is dissatisfy their interest and satisfy and satisfy the west because if nigeria is there a close border historically we are very linked to nigeria this is something that the president of nigeria would have met with the president of cameroon and said guess what brother let's sit and discuss this issue in the southern cameroons and see where we can come to a conclusion so these regional organizations they may not have again we we want african solutions but if you have people who are pivoting to pivoting to the west that is something that would never work and it will we will still be where we are the next 20 30 40 50 years unfortunately until you have the right people with the right set of minds that think for their people and not think for the West. I don't blame the West all of this. In all of this, I blame our own people who help facilitate it. Because you, sh you shouldn't be a stooge for the West. Right. Barista Nineba Innocent Akufo Atonian Council at Law in New York, human rights defender and major proponent of decolonization. Thank you for your time. Absolutely, Mr. Babila. Always a pleasure. And thank you so much for everything. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. Taking us twice up next.